coffee, definitely coffee. Black. Definitely rituals. I mean, the rituals probably come most in my warm up before the show. I mean, the, the feeling that if I do those things, and I will, that it'll relax me. And I've sort of sorted out a whole lot of little bunch of things that I put together, which do everything. So it's a sort of it's a it's a mixture of re relaxation, massage, a little bit of um, muscle tightening, and also um, just relaxing and massaging the shoulders. So. It works for me. Um, not vocal warm up in terms of um, because I'm not singing particularly, but but definitely the the diction of the P's and B's. So I sort of do things like B P B T B P B T B P B T B P B T B P B T B T B P B T B P. It's very fast, and then ta 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 ka 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 ka, just to get all the words. Because if you're nervous and you're acting, then sometimes your your mouth slips. So if you've practiced making contact with, with all your, um, well not with the vowels so much, but the consonants, it, it really helps. Badiga, 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 So I don't really have a phrase. I sometimes listen to, in this show, to the warm-up upstairs on stage, their vocal warm-up, and they do things like Raven's Court, Raven's Court, Raven's Court, Raven's Court Park, Raven's Court Park, Raven's Court Park, Raven's Court Park taken that one on since I've been doing this show by listening to them do that over the tower. <laughs> I don't like telephones going off in the auditorium, I have to say. And I find that very disturbing, but um, they do quite often. <laughs> I love watching these like The Good Wife on television. You know, there's, there's American series. I, I love, you know, when I've got time, I love watching, you know, like the, I'll go through five seasons of it. But I'm just trying to think, isn't it? It sounds like I'm too too good to be true because there must be something guilty that I like doing. Uh, but I can't think. I don't feel guilty about anything that I like doing, so I'm, I can't think what it is. I oh, I liked very much um, uh, Ivor Van Hove's um, uh, the, the the one at the National um, Network. Thank you very much. I thought that was really good and very well staged. No, I really like that. Well, I started, I suppose, wanting to be part of theatre when I was about five years old in Australia before I left um, to come to England when I was ten. Um, but it was mostly, a, it was a, like a dance school and she was called Heather Gell, this woman, and, and I played a water baby in Maeterlinck's Bluebird and I played a rat in the Pied Piper of Hamelin. So, you know, it was this little toddler, this five-year-old, you know, the little leotard and the gills. And so those, that was my first time on a stage. So I was quite young when I appeared on a stage. And so I, I studied ballet throughout my entire school days and did my GCSEs, O levels as they were called then. But then I realized I was not going to be, I was not going to be good enough to be a prima ballerina. So I, I set my sights on acting. I decided I would change and become an actress instead. And then I went to drama school. I went, so I went very young to drama school. I refused to go to university, which is probably a shame. But in a way, I suppose drama school was my university. So I was 17 when I went to Central, Central School of Speech and Drama. And my first jobs were in weekly rep. Um, I, the Connaught Theatre in Worthing was my very first job. And then I did quite a few plays there where you learnt the part you rehearsed it in the morning, you learnt it in the afternoon, and a week later you went on and did it, and then the night after you'd started that you'd learn another play. Well, I couldn't do that now. <laughs> There's no way I could learn a play in a week. Definitely. I think it was really good training. I mean, I think it's sad for people now. There's no week, there's no rep repertory, let alone weekly rep. I mean, obviously, I, I progressed on to three weekly and four weekly rep, which had more, more skill attached to it because, you know, we had longer to rehearse plays, a proper thing. And I was at the Birmingham Rep and places. Uh, but I think it was really good. Yes, I think it's good training that you actually have to. I'm not saying that it might not have been the most wonderful acting in the world, it might not have been the most wonderful production in the world, but the fact that the discipline of having to do it and get over the fear, I think it's very good training, and particularly when you're very young and you, you're able to do that more. I, I did quite a lot of television, and I did theatre, but probably more television in my first 10 years. And then I decided that the kind of theatre I was doing was boring, and it was not really what I had envisaged myself doing and I sort of envisaged myself as a as a physical theatre person 
But in those days, there wasn't any physical theatre in this country, apart from Stephen Burkhoff. He was the only purse practitioner. I mean, the complicity and all of those kind of companies weren't running then. And I had been acting for 10 years when I was complaining to a friend of mine about this. And he said, well, I know Stephen Burkhoff. Should I um, introduce you to him? Because, I mean, he is amazing. And he, he, he is the most perfect physical theatre practitioner in this country at the moment. So he set up a meeting and I did meet him and Stephen liked me and I liked him. So about six months later, he asked me to be in the trial, the, his, his adaptation of the Kafka, the trial, which was being done at the Roundhouse. And that was in 1973 I did that. So I met him in late 72 and, and did that. And that was the first job I did with him. And of course he was a hard taskmaster. It was very, very hard because I had never done any mime and I had to learn it all by watching him because he doesn't sort of teach you, he just expects you to be able to follow. And um, so it was, it was a baptism of fire working with him the first time and I thought, God, I don't know if I can continue this way because it's really hard and he's really hard. I mean, it's just, you know. Anyway, in that um, company, I met these two girls, um, Teresa Debru and Jude Alderson, and they were in his company as well and they said that we're thinking of doing this rock theatre, this feminist rock theatre group. So we, the three of us, to cut a long story short, plus Jackie Taylor who wrote the music, we all joined together. We found the name the Sadista Sisters, when we invented that name, and we proceeded to write and perform our own show. Well, it was a huge success, and we actually had a record album, we had a record contract, and we, we even appeared at the Reading Festival with 30,000 people with the heavy metal groups, but we went to Berlin. We were very successful for a little while, and I gave up acting altogether, and I just was with the Sadista Sisters, and it, we, we were a pre-punk, rock, feminist female group. You know, inevitably we all started fighting amongst ourselves which way the group should go. One Jude wanted it to be far more serious feminist, we didn't. So we sort of gave up after three and a half years and she kept it going for a while. He rang me and said, well it's time we work together again. I want you to come play Gertrude to my Hamlet. You've got to do it, you've got to do it. And I said, well I've got a tiny baby, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. It's great, congratulations, you've got to come. <laughs> so that's when I started working with him over a good many years. So that made me a more, my whole career became more maverick. I sort of shunned the commercial world, so therefore I sort of did myself out of that a bit. But at the same time, I have no regrets because I really have, I feel I've had an interesting career and I've really loved all the different things I've done. And then I've gone back, I mean, God, I was in EastEnders for two and a half years. I've gone back to doing television. I do quite a lot of television as well. And now there's that lovely mixture. And I'm still going after 57 years. No, it is 57 years I've been doing it. I didn't know that Harold and Maud was a play. I did know it was a film because I saw the film years ago. And then when I realised it was a play, not just by doing it now, but I already knew it was a play and I had discussed it with my friend and lodger and he'd said, you should play it sometime. And I said, yes, I should. I did a play called Mother Adam a few years ago, which was at the German Street Theatre. And that was um, a really weird, it's a play by uh, Charles Dwyer, that's his name, and um, it, it, it's this extraordinary woman, and a, it's a two-hander, and her, Jasper Britton played my sort of dysfunctional son, and I'm a dysfunctional mother who's in bed and paralysed from the, from the neck down, so it was quite a hard part to play, but she's a funny, eccentric woman wearing a turban. I modelled it on my mother, actually. I mean, one of my most favourite plays of all time was the one that Stephen Burkhoff wrote for us to do together, which was called Decadence. Well, what I, what I love about her is the fact that she is completely anarchic. She doesn't like rules. She doesn't believe that, you know, anything is forever. It's just her whole philosophy on life, which is sort of so endearing and so sort of uplifting that she manages to meet this young man just at the sort of twilight years of her life and sort of convince him of his, his own mortality and, and his own life and sort of turns things around for him. I think it's a very... I think it's a very loving play, actually. In a funny kind of a way, I like new theatre and new work better. I suppose try something new as often as possible. Tennessee Williams, um, what other, oh, um, I like, it's sort of the American writers I like. I have a feeling that might be the, way, the reason, because I've always had a great, great love for Tennessee Williams and there's, 
even the accent, the, the sort of deep South accent is, is sort of a little bit like the Australian accent. I mean, there's a mixture between Cockney and, and the deep South. I suppose one of my ch most challenging career choices at the time was to actually leave acting and start a rock group and to, and to actually go on the road and do what, you know, sex, drugs and rock and roll. Do you know what I mean? That you are part of that world. And I found that quite scary, but at the same time very liberating because it was actually, there was something so mad and in your face about it that you, you know, and, and you get such a reaction from the people. But I mean, that was a career choice because I mean, I was doing it for three and a half years. So therefore I wasn't actually acting during that time. I was doing that. 1999, I decided to do my first solo show, um, aided and abetted by Stephen Burkhoff, who said, you know, you should take power into your own hands. You say, you know, work gets less when you get older, but do a solo show. It was such a success. I went round the world with it. I've been to practically every country in the world. And then after that, every two years, I took to Edinburgh another show. And my third show, not the second one, which was by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, but the third one was an autobiographical show. And that's where I learned to be a trapeze artist. And I was 62 then. The show was called No Fear, and it was about fear, about what people are frightened of and what they're not, and some of my wild things that I did in my youth. It was a, a very successful show, and that show went round the world as well. And I did a series of shows, and that's, that, you know, that was a scary opening into another new world, of which I seem to be a, going to be doing another one, which I'm just in development over. After I saw I wouldn't do any more, but this will be number eight. And then working, doing Hamlet with the puppets, the Georgian puppets, that was probably the most challenging show. We rehearsed in Tbilisi with this mad puppeteer director who was like a god. I was playing, his idea was to have a woman playing Hamlet, but all the puppets played all the other characters. But what he forgot to tell me is that they didn't speak English, so I had to voice all the puppets and play Hamlet and play this old refugee woman. I mean, it was really hard, and I played Hamlet. So um, that was probably, now I, now I know that was my most challenging show. <laughs> Hamlet with the Georgian puppets. But now we did that at Edinburgh, and it was a huge success, but it was tough. Um, actually not. I think that I came into this profession to just enjoy doing what I did. And I think that by, by giving myself so many different aspects, I'm still going after 57 years. And I know a lot of people who actually, who did have a very commercial career and made lots of money and were in films, but they don't even act anymore. And I just feel that, and I wanted to be a dancer, I wouldn't be doing ballet anymore. So I feel that I don't have any regrets because I'm still doing what I love doing. And it doesn't seem to stop. So therefore that must be, you know, it's, it's all the new adventures along the way. Very much don't wait for the telephone to ring Try to do, if, you, if you're not being employed, if there's not work there, try to do, to create something for yourself. Do it, don't, don't shy away from it. If you want to do it, if you have a passion for it, then you should do it. So learn to live with rejection and tenacity. I would say those are two very good things. I just love, I love doing what I'm doing. I hope that I will always be fit enough to do it and just carry on playing the parts until it, the day that I actually feel that I can't learn anything anymore, then obviously I will give up. But while I can still learn it and have the energy to do it, then I, I don't see any reason to stop.